A new U.S. intelligence report sheds light on the origins of the pandemic. It seems to support the idea that the pandemic resulted from a Chinese lab accident. That's after a fact-checking website removed a label calling it a conspiracy theory. One worker is facing dire consequences after protesting for fair wages. He has now been deemed a target in one of China's anti-terrorist drills. Some call it a technique used to intimidate human rights defenders. 21 runners lost their lives in an ultra-marathon race. But investigations reveal that the tragedy might have been avoidable. And controversy surrounds China's organ transplant industry. We look into what's happening behind the scenes and examine the accusations made against Beijing. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. A new U.S. intelligence report may shed light on the origins of the pandemic. It seems to support the theory that the virus first emerged from a lab accident in Wuhan, China. On Sunday, the Wall Street Journal revealed information from a still classified U.S. intelligence report. It says that around the start of initial virus outbreak in November 2019, three researchers from China's Wuhan Institute of Virology were sickened, becoming so symptomatic that they sought hospital treatment. The report seems to add on to an earlier U.S. intelligence fact sheet. It had disclosed that researchers working there were sickened in fall of 2019, with symptoms consistent with both COVID-19 and common seasonal illness. The latest report also fuels allegations that one of the institute's labs may have shut down due to a virus outbreak among staff in October 2019. That's when the facility allegedly shut down for over two weeks at the time. The high security lab is known to study different types of coronaviruses. The suggestion comes through analysis of cell phone location data. From October 7th to the 24th, 2019, no cell phone activity registered in this portion of the Wuhan lab. Some argue the building was closed due to a hazardous event that may have happened there. But the White House says in terms of the report, we have no means of confirming that or denying that. It is not a report from the United States. On Monday, China's foreign ministry also denied the accusation. A spokesman said that there has been zero infection among staff in the Wuhan lab. The journal's report comes amid growing calls for a second probe into the origins of the pandemic. On Monday, two GOP Congress members called on their Democrat colleagues to launch a full and complete investigation. Those reports aren't the only source casting doubt on the pandemic's origins. U.S.-based fact-checking group PolitiFact seems to have changed its mind on the Wuhan lab leak suspicion, suggesting that it no longer considers it a conspiracy theory. The nonprofit has retracted one of its fact-checking labels. The label previously stamped the Wuhan lab origin idea as a conspiracy theory. This comes a few days after a comment Fauci made to a PolitiFact reporter. Dr. Anthony Fauci was recently asked whether he was still confident that the virus developed naturally. But no, I'm not convinced uh, about that. I think that we should continue to investigate what went on in China until we find out, to the best of our ability, exactly what happened. Dr. Fauci says he supports any kind of investigation that probes the origins of the virus. The PolitiFact label originally targeted remarks by Hong Kong virologist Ian Li Meng. Last year, she said she had solid scientific evidence that is not from nature, but rather it is a man-made virus created in the lab. In an updated editor's note released on Monday, PolitiFact explained why it removed the label. It reads, when this fact check was first published in September 2020, PolitiFact sources included researchers who asserted the SARS-CoV-2 virus could not have been manipulated. That assertion is now more widely disputed. Yin Li Meng worked as a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Hong Kong. She also previously worked for a key disease lab for the Chinese Communist Party and conducted surveillance for zoonotic viruses like SARS. An electric scooter exploded in front of a government compound in northeast China's Liaoning province on Monday. Surveillance video shows that a man walked his scooter near the entrance of the compound when the vehicle suddenly blew up. The dense smoke at the scene formed a mushroom cloud about 65 feet wide. Local authorities report that the man died on the spot, while five others suffered minor injuries. Just a warning, the following footage may be disturbing for some viewers due to its graphic nature. 
，那个那那个车是晚的操的，嗯，这行人都过去了，哎呦我操，就在现在，嘣，到，哎呦我操。It is unclear if the man planned the explosion, but Chinese netizens are still questioning whether an unmodified electric scooter has the power to create such an explosion. Some say there could have been explosives on the scooter, and some are speculating whether this was an attack on the municipal government. The hashtag of the news saw over four million views on Chinese social media platform Weibo. The Chinese regime appears to consider protesters terrorists. Beijing's Public Security Bureau held an anti-terrorist exercise at a major shopping mall in the city in mid-April, and they set the terrorist in this drill as a worker protesting to get his wage. CCP mouthpiece CCTV aired the exercise and posted the video on its website in April, but they soon deleted it. In it, viewers can see an actor entering the mall holding a sign that says "Pay me my hard-earned money," and he was shouting the same line. The actor then knocked down a security guard with his sign. CCTV said the so-called terrorist committed an armed assault, and it caused chaos. As part of the drill, many security guards and public security officers, armed with riot gear, arrived and subdued the man. It is common in China nowadays for employers to delay paying their workers, partly due to the economic downturn. In some cases, workers can't get any wage for even a year. That's why many workers have protested to demand their wage, and Chinese riot police often respond to such protests. Chinese netizens say setting a protester as a terrorist is unique to China. Many suspect that the so-called drill was to intimidate Chinese rights defenders and activists. A comment on Twitter says, "Which fool will go to the shopping mall to ask for wages? This is a show for people to watch, telling you not to cause trouble, or they will arrest you if you do so. There are audiences in the mall. Some think this is outrageous, saying people can't get paid working their jobs, and they even get classified as terrorists. Is it reasonable not to pay?" More details about China's deadly ultra marathon race are beginning to emerge, according to U.S. media Radio Free Asia or RFA. Official corruption may have had something to do with the tragedy. Extreme weather conditions hit during the race on Saturday, and 21 professional runners lost their lives due to a lack of resupply and assistance. Authorities blame the weather, but a source reveals to RFA that up to 30 percent of the race's income had to go to the local official in charge as kickbacks. The source says there is no public bidding for this year's race. Rather, the local Chinese Communist regime propaganda department directly appointed a man named Wu Xiyuan to organize the race. Wu runs a company with only 20 employees, yet he somehow manages to operate almost all marathons in a local city. The source says, on top of the 30% kickback, Wu has to pay at least 5,000 U.S. dollars to the local official in charge in the name of instruction and certification. Ms. Wang from the China Mountaineering Association tells RFA that such an event will need at least a 500-person support team, but Wu had only nine people, and each resupply point is over six miles away from each other. That is extremely dangerous for runners. Wang also says it is common in China for organizers of similar events to cut manpower and basic supplies. That's because they need to pay kickbacks. Reports are still flowing in from China's Gansu province. A disabled runner there is dead after participating in an ultramarathon race over the weekend. Wang Guanjun was a Paralympic Games champion, winning the men's hearing impaired marathon in 2019. But despite his success, he was known to keep his aspirations humble. Chinese media report that, according to his friend, Wang came from a poor family, often using his competition winnings to support his parents and keeping little for himself. For every race he won, competition prize money meant earning several hundred dollars to help them. Wang was one of more than 20 competitors who were killed in the ultra marathon. The extensive race turned deadly when temperatures in the region plummeted, and harsh winter weather set in. A group of five runners were among the lucky ones, saved by local shepherd Zhu Keming. Zhu first realized something was wrong when he heard cries for help nearby his cave shelter. He soon discovered the athletes, immediately bringing them to shelter inside and lighting a fire. The shepherd later explained that this kind of weather is common. 
Another marathon runner survived thanks to an unusual method that kept him alert. As the severe weather conditions set in, runner Wang Jingming was soon chilled to the bone. He said he tried everything to keep himself awake, fighting the cold while waiting for rescuers. He explained he began to lose consciousness as temperatures plunged. At first, he used his dwindling strength to pinch himself, an effort to keep himself clear-headed. But soon he could no longer feel his arms and legs. By then, he started to bite his tongue and his lips, later recalling that the pain kept him alert and reminded him that he had to survive in order to see his family again. He was rescued some time later. Event organizers first realized something had gone horribly wrong just three hours after the race began. That's when the race's WeChat social media group started flooding with messages, many containing cries for help like several people have lost consciousness and urgent help needed. Some survivors later described wind conditions as so strong they couldn't stand, while others reported their thermal blankets were shredded by the conditions. The Chinese regime is denying pension benefits to millions of Chinese workers. The regime says this is because these people quit their jobs and they don't qualify for pensions. But many of the victims also include prisoners of conscience who are forced to leave their job. The Chinese regime has been denying pension benefits to tens of millions of workers in recent years. Most of the workers have either quit, resigned or been fired from their job, or they had to leave their post to spend time in jail. When that happens, authorities would reduce their length of service to zero and refuse to recognize the number of years they've worked for. This then disqualifies the workers from their pension benefits. 59-year-old rights defender Wang Guoqi from Beijing is one of them. If the public security department has dealt with you before, the number of years you've already worked wouldn't count towards your pension plan, so you can't get pension. Wang says in his case that was because authorities charged him with what they called counter-revolutionary crimes. Back in 1989, Wang was working at a college in Beijing, and he joined China's nationwide pro-democracy movement with his students. The movement eventually resulted in the Tiananmen Square massacre. The Communist Party ordered troops to open fire on peaceful protesters in Beijing, killing thousands of them. Following the crackdown, the school fired Wang for his participation in the movement, and Wang had to spend a year behind bars. After his release, Wang helped establish a few pro-democracy organizations in China, including the underground Liberal Democratic Party. The party aims to end the CCP's one-party rule and to set up a democratic system. For that, the regime again arrested Wang. They sentenced him to 11 years in prison, he only came out of jail in 2003. Sentencing people to jail already serves as one form of punishment. Why does the CCP have to punish people again? This makes no sense. Wang says the communist regime also seized his home in Beijing. Now he has no choice but to live on the streets, carrying only a blanket with him. Even worse, Wang is still struggling with multiple illnesses, including heart and brain diseases. He relies on his relatives and friends to buy him medicine. Wang says he received around $180 of low-income relief per month last year. But that's far from enough. To make ends meet in Beijing, he needs at least over $450 a month. I simply can't survive, can't make it through. The officials have to compensate me financially for taking away my property, my home. Wang's situation isn't unique. The regime also threw two other human rights activists in jail for taking part in the pro-democracy movement and deprived them of their pension benefits after their release. One of the activists joined a grassroots petition campaign to seek justice for workers without pension benefits. Some of the workers without pensions have worked their entire life. About 2,000 people signed the petition urging the communist regime to take action but to no avail. Wang is hoping that the international community can pay attention to Chinese petitioners. Coming up, controversy surrounds China's organ transplant industry. We look into what's happening behind the scenes and examine the accusations made against Beijing. More on that after the break.
trends may be fleeting, but values are timeless. We now bring you this new clothing brand with classic design and luxurious comfort. It's our way of sharing hope and inspiration from the world of Shenyun. We bring you Shenyun Dancer. Wear it with honor. Now, let's take a look at controversy surrounding China's organ transplant industry. China is the world's second largest country for organ transplants. In 2018 alone, over 20,000 organ transplant surgeries took place in China. The Chinese regime has long faced allegations that it harvests organs from prisoners of conscience, including Falun Gong practitioners, Uyghurs, and possibly house Christians. The regime denies the allegations, saying the industry only uses organs from public donors and that the organs are donated voluntarily and not paid for. But a former industry insider is telling us the opposite. He says a large sum of organs aren't donated voluntarily and are in fact paid for. And among organ transplant professionals, it is a common practice to manipulate the family members of potential organ suppliers into selling their loved ones' organs. The insider says a money web lies underneath the transplant industry. That's because an individual's organs could be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. So every time hospitals can secure a source of organs, multiple parties involved in the web can make a handsome profit. The insider asked NTD to protect his identity, so we gave him the pseudonym Liang Ping, and we also used a voice actor to repeat what he said word for word. So what you will hear later on is the voice actor. Liang had first-hand access to China's organ transplant system because he worked at a major transplant hospital in northeastern China. He was an organ donation coordinator there. People like him are crucial for China's booming transplant industry because they are the ones that help secure more organs. These coordinators work in a unit under transplant hospitals, and over 60 percent of Chinese organ transplant hospitals have units like this. For Liang, a typical work process starts like this. For example, let's say an emergency room admitted a patient that suffered a traumatic brain injury. After checking on the patient, the emergency room finds that he's brain dead and that his family members most likely can't afford his medical expenses. Then the emergency room would contact our work unit. Then we would go negotiate with the family. The most important goal of the negotiation is to persuade family members into giving away their loved one's organs. But Liang says this is where unethical practices come into play. It's called organ transplant coordination on the surface, but many underhanded means are involved in private. Liang says when he first took up the job, he really didn't know what it was all about. But after I became more familiar with the work, over time I found it hard to bear. One of the preconditions for an organ transplant is that the organ supplier has to be brain dead. Strictly speaking, some organ suppliers didn't meet the criteria for being brain dead, and there are many cases like that. Liang says he witnessed a case before, and that organ supplier came from a very poor family. This person could still be saved, but his family chose not to treat him. He says instead the family chose to starve the patient and cash out. The doctor then starved the patient for a week, and his organs were extracted after he had met the condition. In many countries, including the U.S., it is illegal to pay for organs. One of the concerns is that the organ trade could prey on the poor. But in China, Liang says the poor are exactly what the organ transplant coordinators target. The coordinators would often check a potential organ supplier's financial situation before approaching his or her family members. If the families are migrant workers, most likely the negotiations would be successful. Migrant workers are among China's low-income groups. Liang says the poor become the target because they often cannot afford expensive medical bills and are more vulnerable. Yet the organ coordinators have found one trick to be particularly useful. An organ coordinator would target the most greedy person of the family, the person that badly needs money. Go talk to that person. As long as you get that person, he would go to convince his family members. 
saying things like, the patient is about to die anyway, but we wouldn't be able to get the money after the patient dies. Liang witnessed one such case himself. The patient was in his late 20s and was admitted to the intensive care unit. Later, the hospital declared he's brain dead. He was quite young, so his organs were exceptionally good. Also, his blood type was really good. He's type O. People with blood type O are universal donors and can donate to any other blood type. Because that person was really young, he was unmarried and didn't have any children. When my colleague approached the family, the patient's parents at first didn't agree to give away his organs. But Liang's colleague later found out that the patient's older sister was quite greedy and really needed money. Also, the sister had been footing her brother's medical bills. To put it bluntly, she needed to sell her younger brother for money in order to pay off her debt. Liang's colleague then approached the sister and she agreed for the sake of money. Then the sister went to argue with her parents, saying things like, we have to donate for the greater cause. But actually, it was all for money. The parents finally gave their consent, and about five days later, the hospital removed the organs from this patient. During this time, we could tell that the patient's mother was really sad. Liang said even after the patient had passed away, his sister tried to get the money from his medical insurance account. Just imagine how greedy this person is. She wouldn't even let go of the money in her brother's health insurance account after he had passed. Only by targeting people like her and every family can you succeed in your negotiations. Liang says he pities the patient's family members. The family members weren't entirely willing to cash out the patient's organs. None of them were entirely willing to do that. They were all pressured by the circumstances and had little choice. Many of them belong to this category. Liang says behind China's organ transplant industry is a money web. That's because doctors can harvest multiple vital organs from one individual, and each organ comes with an expensive price tag. For a liver transplant surgery, hospitals charge an equivalent of over 80,000 U.S. dollars. Each kidney is worth over 60,000 U.S. dollars. So just one liver and two kidneys from a single individual are worth well over $200,000. But who gets a share of this money? Liang says about half goes to different kinds of expenses. They include the cost of the surgery itself, payments to the organ supplier's family, and the cost of the supplier's funeral. After that, there's about $100,000 left. This sum of money can't see the light. It's in the hands of our work unit director, but he wouldn't keep all of it to himself. Liang explains the director would compensate other departments that helped identify such a patient, such as the ICU and the emergency room. If the director checked the patient's personal information through the police system, he would later pay the police. Doctors that did the transplant surgery would also get a share. Those on the hospital's management team would get a share. The organ donation coordinators would also get a small commission. Liang quit the job after half a year. He hopes to shine a light on China's transplant industry so that more people can know the truth about it. And that's all for today's China in Focus. But before you go, China in Focus is partnering with the Epoch Times newspaper on their new subscription-based streaming platform, Epoch TV. That's where you can watch our exclusive special reports, like this one, every Friday night. And then we'll explore questions like how China lures in foreign companies to steal their technology, how the Chinese regime is actively collecting health data on people around the world, how the ancient Chinese philosophy of good governance differs from the current day communist regime, and much more. Be sure to check out these investigative episodes by clicking on the link in the description down below. And don't forget to subscribe to this channel if you really want to understand what's happening with China. You can still watch our Monday to Thursday episodes for free on YouTube, NTD Cable TV, the NTD website, and the Epoch TV website. In our latest special report, China is speeding up its plans for digital currency. The digital renminbi is being tested in many regions in China. Building a cross-border payment system to push the use of the Chinese yuan for global trade. All part of a bigger plan to challenge the U.S. dollar. It's all about harvesting part of the dollar hegemony. We can't overthrow the dollar hegemony all at once, but there's every chance. And eventually push the Chinese yuan to dominate the global monetary system. Um, I mean, if you think that the United States has a lot of power through our Treasury sanctions authorities, 
you, you ain't seen nothing yet compared to uh, people who have to transact in digital serialized currency that can be tracked uh, its entire history up to, the, to where it is in a moment. That currency can be turned off like a light switch. But what will it mean for the world when transaction data ends up in the hands of an authoritarian regime known for its surveillance state and strict control over its people? In this special report, we explore how far the Chinese regime has gotten toward forcing its yuan onto the global stage and what risks its success could have for the world economy. Be sure to check it out on Epoch TV. Thanks for watching and see you tomorrow.